Joining me now here on the Knicks Film School pregame show. I should say this at the top. We are recording this before we know the result of the Knicks game against the Hawks on Friday night. I am stepping into dangerous waters and hopefully I will keep it as evergreen as possible. This will not be the Knicks looking for their first win of the season against the Pelicans. But uh, regardless, the Knicks do head down to the to uh, the Big Easy, I believe is what it's called down in New Orleans uh, to take on the Pelicans. Um, in the Pelicans' second game of the season, hopefully handing them their first loss. And joining me to preview this game from the In the Know podcast, Mason Ginsberg. Mason, welcome back to the Knicks Film School pregame show. Thanks, man. Great to be here. Appreciate you having me. So I have so many questions about the Pelicans that I me hope... Me too. Well, <laughs> that might be actually where we could start in the curiosity about the Pelicans and their future in this roster. They probably have the most variance when I was doing my preseason predictions for like our Patreon and just our staff picks of where I could put them. I'm sure you can relate to the, the not confusion, but the uncertainty of the Pelicans. Can you speak to the uncertainty that as a person who covers this team that you might be feeling? Yeah, this team goes to Zion gifts. I mean, I think last season taught us that Zion was healthy for the first two and a half months of the season. The Pelicans went into 2023 tied for the lead in the Western Conference. Um, they were very good. Um, and and B.I. missed some of those games, too. So it was really the Zion show uh, with C.J. and the rest of the supporting cast. And they were they were a good team. Um, and then Zion gets hurt. Uh, wheels kind of fall off the bus. Uh, Ingram is great, but he's you know, not the guy Zion is. Can't be that really can't can't be the single driving force behind uh, a, a sustained success the way we, we you know we hope to see. Um, and so that really, that, that, that's it. And so it's, people ask me, like, they point to, I think the Pelicans over under this year is around like, you know, mid forties, like half of the Western conference. It's a very tightly packed and, and, uh, competitive <laughs> conference this year. And I was like, I don't know, like, if you believe Zion's finally going to be healthy this year and there's, he's saying the right things, they've changed over some of the medical staff in New Orleans. And so they're doing the right things. And, and if, if you tell me he can even play 60, 60 games this year. I'll tell you, the Pelicans are, you know, could be in a position where they even avoid the play and they're a top six Western Conference team. Um, if he has another year that's like just like the last few years where he hasn't really played enough, uh, this team's gonna be fighting for their lives, just like last year. So um, you know, that's that's kind of where they are. I do think, you know, maybe their floor is a little higher than people are giving them credit for because I did miss a lot of games last year and they still hovered right around five hundred. Um, and so I, I don't think their floor is is too low, but yeah, I mean, if this team's going to be any good and make any noise, they've got to have a reasonably healthy season, which hasn't. Do the Knicks fan that I guess is unaware? Uh, I know I've mentioned the stats before, but I've more done it like from the time he got hurt on. But to Mason's point about what the Pelicans were when he got hurt, which I believe is January third of of last season. Um, the Pelicans are the fourth best net rating. They were 24 and 14, as you mentioned, tied for the number one seed in the Western Conference. And then he goes down with an injury that just it seemed to, from my perspective, escalate to a season ending injury. Um, before I don't want to fully dwell on last season. I'm sure you don't want to talk about last season anymore, but do the Knicks fan that. I just is unaware of why just taking Zion out created such a, a downturn. What happened to the team after Zion went out for the season? Yeah. I mean, Zion can create offense by himself. Um, he, he is a, he is a force and the Pelicans, I think their lack of perimeter off their, their, their lack of shooting was really more exposed with Zion out. And so you had a couple of players in Baron Ingram and CJ McCollum that, they're good at isolation, but we all know that's not the most efficient form of offense. And so they, they took a I mean, heavy on the mid range. And so there's just the, the, the team didn't have a cohesive offense that, and, and this it's partially the, the system is partially to blame Jonas. I couldn't, I can't explain to you why his role last year was reduced compared to the year before we were yelling about it a lot about, you know, the, the guy is, is, is a great post presence and a good guy to dump the ball into. If you're trying to generate, you know, a higher percentage looks, the team brought in uh, James Borrego over the off season um, and, and to, to, to essentially fix the offense. Um, and so there's, um, you know, there's, there's hope there too, but really it just comes down to the fact that the team couldn't consistently generate good looks, um, uh, you know, clean offensive looks with, with Zion uh, out of the picture. 
makes sense. And to again to speak to Mason's point, um, after the Zion injury, and I I've, I know I've mentioned this, they were 25th in offensive rating in the sport with an overall negative uh, net rating. Um, yeah, I'm. It 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 seems as simple as you're saying that like they go as Zion goes, which if you I don't want you to have to speak for the entire fan base, but if you had to. What, is there a frustration level that exists with with going into year five with him and, and his inability to stay on the court? Yeah, I, I mean, certainly. Um, I think, you know, it, it, it's always hard with injuries, right, to, to figure out, like, well, how much is to blame with, for his, you know, him working to stay healthy versus just bad luck. And so mm-hmm. um, I think there's a general frustration throughout the roster because Brent Ingram missed a lot of time for what was essentially amounted to a, a toe bruise. Um, and so there was questions around, you know, like, is, is does he have to be out as long as he he was out? Um, and so it wasn't just limited to Zion. The whole team had some injury issues. Whereas CJ McCollum played the last two months of the season with a broken broke figure or, or, or wrist mm-hmm. or something like that, where he played through injuries. And so there was this kind of un, lack of balance, I think, about how Pelicans players themselves responded to injuries of varying degrees. Um, and so I think you know that I, I don't want to just point pinpoint Zion because uh, the whole team did have some struggles. And, and even this year, they've got. The, the, the main guys are healthy, but the sporting cast is pretty beat up. I mean, you know, Larry Nance just got back from an injury, played played in the opening game, but he didn't play in the preseason. Alvarado's out. Um, he's a real spark plug for this team off the bench. Trey Murphy's probably the biggest guy who's out. He's going to be out for the next month or so with a with a knee injury or maybe two months. So, so th- they've got to help rely heavily on their their big guns. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there is frustration. It feels like nothing can – the team can never be fully healthy. It's been a decade-long problem, even dating back to, you know, Boogie Cousins tearing his Achilles um, and, and and things b- b- before that. Um, Eric Gordon, like you name it, like this team's had, had challenges with some of their you know, big-name players. Um, but, but yeah, so we'll, we'll see if this season's any different. <laughs> so before we pivot officially to this season – and it's tough because it's been one game. Um, but I, the off season, again, from the outside looking in and hearing, or I guess reading the uh, Zion Portland trade rumors and, and potentially trading for uh, the opportunity to get Scoot Henderson. How did you receive all of that? And, and what was your, your vantage point? And are you, are you surprised that Zion ended not getting traded for the number two pick? No, uh, I'm not surprised. I, I mean, and he was, it sounded like people talked about him. People talked about Brandon Ingram. Um, so, I mean, a, a couple of things on that. One is that the new CBA is making it very punitive to be a consistent tax team. I, the irony is that the Pelicans right now are a little bit over the tax line. Mm-hmm. Um, but so that is one thing. And then, um, you know, I, I just, I, this team and David Griffin specifically, They've just kind of treaded water, and so th- they've used like the injuries is also almost as a crush. Uh, it seems so, to to not do anything like anything kind of big. They've had all these picks from the Lakers trade with AD, from the Bucks trade with Drew Holiday. They've had all these picks and really not done shit with them. They basically <laughs> just kind of said, "All right, we have these picks to go use for a star if we want to go do it." And they just haven't done it, and they've made picks around the they made moves around the edges. Um, but so given the track record, I had no reason to expect they were going to make a big splash. I mean, I think there is a question to come. So my, uh, you know, the co-host of In the Know, Schmidt, has done a great job of kind of over the offseason chronicling what the implications are for the new CBA and the tax stuff. And it's, you know, the Pelicans are going to have a decision to make pretty soon with it, with Ingram extension coming up, along with this, the, the kind of money owed to CJ and to Zion. Um, so it's a it's going to be very expensive. And so that was the rationale behind maybe resetting a little bit and making a move for Scoot is that he's going to be on that rookie scale contract and you little, you know, alleviate some of the concern. And if you really think that Scoot is that guy, then yeah, go for it. And so we'll never really truly know what the offers were on the table and who was more likely to go in the potential deal between Ingram and Zion. A lot of that stuff was just you know, not, not public and for good reason. But um, yeah, I mean, I think there was real, there was real smoke there. It's just the team ultimately decided let's run it back. Let's this time we're going to be healthy. So we'll see. To follow up on that, was it the Pelicans that decided to like run it back and and keep the team as is, or did you? I, again, I was outside looking in on this this uh, this interaction with Portland, but yeah. but like did or did Portland say no? We're we're good. We don't. We'd rather roll the dice with with. So for those kids yes. on the podcast audience, a shrug <laughs> emoji just appeared. That's. I mean, it, it's it, there, there's no way to to truly right, assign right. that because. It's all negotiation, right? The Pelicans could have said, 
you know, they're, you, you're asking for too much. You're asking for Zion plus you're asking for him plus in Portland, you know, Portland could have said, you know what? We, we believe in Scoot Anderson and, and we, not, nothing is going to make us trade him. So who knows? Um, but I, but there was, I, I you know, there was real smoke there. Um, for whatever reason, one, you know, this didn't end up happening. I should clarify. I think I said the number two pick. Portland had the number three pick uh, in the draft. So for anybody that wants to be uh, impeccable with the details like myself, I made sure I clarified. It's a an interesting situation that the Pelicans, I believe, find themselves in. And I'm sure you you get it. Like you have the superstar. You have the perfect like running mate in potentially in Brandon Ingram. The roster seems to be filled out like CJ McCollum. If he's a third best player, your team's probably really good. You have good young players with, with Trey Murphy, although there, there's an injury there that you have to talk about. And then you got Herb Jones and, and yep. other younger, exciting players. So like the team's built well, except for that one thing about availability that I'm sure yep. I, I would drive like if that was the Knicks team right now, I have no idea how we would process it. It would just be like, they've actually built this team pretty well. It's yeah. just we don't really get to see them together uh, at at yeah. all. Um, you mentioned the over unders for the the Western Conference, and when we went through them, that's like the thing we brought up with the Pelicans is the variance. So knowing that that how good the roster can be and everything we've talked about so far, um, what does a disappointing season look like if it's not like? the exact same thing from what we saw as far as the availability and the injuries uh, kind of taking over what the outcome is. It, it is the exact same thing. Like that, so is, it, that is, cause, cause, so cause that's, let me, let me clarify. Yeah. I'm going to clarify. Yeah, go, so go like yeah. if they, if they end up winning 45 games and getting bounced in the first round, but everyone was healthy for it, you'll be like, they, they were healthy for a season. Now we can go on with this team and move forward. Or, or at least make conformed decisions about what to do. I think okay. that's the that's and, and to tie it back to my comments around Griffin in the front office, like you know they they have they decided not to do anything because they don't have enough information to make a big a big move. I mean that could be a cop out. I would argue that's kind of a cop out because um, there are the biggest question I see that's been consistent for the start is even though even if you don't have the data to support it, there's still a big question of who is the right running mate in the front court for Zion Williamson because hmm. he's such a unique talent. He's not if you put him at the five, which the Pelicans have already tried, and I think it's they should try it. Um, as a, as the five, he's not going to, they're not going to rebound the ball well, unless they have, you know, essentially plus defenders all throughout the rest of the lineup. Um, and so th- there, there is that big question of kind of what is the right front court pairing for Zion. Um, but so I think that is, yeah, it, it's one, if there's health, at least you have an idea of what, what's possible. Um, so that's the, that's the first thing I, um, I'd almost rather them be not great, but healthy than be, like you said, 45 wins, but still injuries pop up and you feel like you don't understand what the full potential of this team is. Mm. So um, it, it is at least, at least then you have the, the rationale to make a, some sort of decision uh, of magnitude about this team. Um, I guess, but yeah, I guess I, I wonder like with the Knicks, with our preseason predictions, like if I were to ask myself the same question, a first round exit after getting to the second round last year, um, and it's not even necessarily their seed. I would hate if they felt like a six seed and they lose to Cleveland, especially after beating Cleveland. But like, yeah. it's very results oriented is what a disappointing mm-hmm. Knicks season would look like. Whereas I almost wonder, like, like I said, finishing the race seems like an accomplishment. If, yeah. if you're a Pelicans fan looking at this season and I, you mentioned the decisions that they they'd have to make. So if, if you want to, look into our crystal ball. I know we have 81 more games that we have to look at this, but let's play out the best case scenario. What happens with this team in, in your eyes? Yeah. I mean, BI and Zion play 60 plus this team is a, a you know, a, at least a second round playoff team, because I think they are, if they're healthy you now they've proven they can be a top four seed in the West. Um, mm-hmm. And so I don't expect this team to suddenly make the, you know, Western conference finals or get to the NBA finals. But I do think that this team can is capable of that full health of winning a playoff series in a very competitive Western conference. And so if you've got, if you've got enough games, they're key players. And like, I'm not asking for 75, 80 games. Like let's start with 60, <laughs> let's start with 60 <laughs> games of health for their key guys. Um, because I think they do have the supporting cast. And then when Trey Murphy comes back, even Jonas, I mean, I think there's, there's a concerted effort for him to take more threes. He took, he took a few in the, in the first game. Um, he, he went, uh, two or four from three point range. And so, and he's, he's capable of hitting that shot. And so I do think at full strength, 
they've got enough shooting. Um, I, I'm not sold on the first round pick of Jordan Hawkins yet, but the guy can, he's a good movement shooter. And so they, they've got enough there again, at full strength to really be dangerous. Um, and so, uh, you know, that that's, I think that is, you know, the, 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 the best, the better case scenario is probably, you know, you win a playoff series and, and you're competitive, at least, you know, fighting for a spot in the Western conference final. Cause the team has the talent to do. Did you do preseason predictions for your pod? <laughs> uh, for the whole conference or yeah, for the whole or, conference. I'm basically about to ask you what your one through six is. Yeah. Um, so my one, my one through six, I don't know if we did the, the full, the full rankings, but I mean, I, I, I feel like the, uh, it's, yeah, it's tough. I mean, cause I had Memphis up there in, until the, uh, the Stephen Adams injury, I think it's bigger than mm. maybe a lot of people give him credit for, but, but I mean, like it is, I'd be shocked if, if Denver and Phoenix aren't one and two. And from there, mm. I, it seriously comes down to health. Cause I, I think the, I'm lower on the Kings because they were the, you know, pinnacle of health last season. No one missed more than a few games of the year. And so I, I don't see them that happening again for them. But, you know, I, I really, beyond the top two, I, I think it does come down to whose stars are healthy. Um, and so I think there's a little bit more wiggle room for the Nuggets. I mean, you saw even two years ago with Jamal Murray out for a lot of the season, they still won 48 games. I mean, so like Jokic is that guy. Um, and they have enough around him, I think, to withstand just with the continuity aspect. And then Phoenix, obviously, has got a bunch of stars. Um, and so they probably should have enough to stay afloat. But yeah, I don't, I don't really know beyond that. I mean, there's just so much uncertainty. Um, and so there's so much talent, essentially, in the conference. Where, whereas I think in the East, it's pretty, the top five feel like the same as last year, even with this, this, all this shit going down in Philly. Um, and so I think it's a little bit more clear on, in that conference. Interesting. So it's only been one game for the Pelicans this season, a good win on the road in Memphis. Uh, if I had to ask you for a one game overreaction to that win, what would it be? Oh man. Um, the overreaction. Um, I look at kind of the, uh, that the offense is finally kind of figuring it out. Um, after last year, there, there wasn't a lot of, 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 of clarity there. Cause the Pelicans did have, Zion had a very quiet first half and he kind of blew up in the second half. Um, I think that's the, the good thing is that you're seeing good high volume, three point eight, three point shooting from, from a lot of their guys, Matt, Matt Ryan, who was that sign a few for the season, chucked up six threes for the Pelicans, went three of six. Mm-hmm. So had the highest plus minus and the team was plus 20 against them, which is absolutely insane. It shows how much, how much the team needs shooting and what, what that means to the team on the flip side. They turned the ball over 21 times. Uh, that's not good. And that is a problem that was, that was happening in the preseason as well. So I am a little nervous about ball, ball control, but look, Zion's back. They didn't play with him much last year. They're still trying to figure things out. Um, but I guess that's, that's, that's kind of what I, what I look at the pros and cons of the, of the, of the team offensively. I don't want to read too much in the defense because honestly, beyond Desmond Bain, like the Grizzlies don't have a lot of healthy guys who are, who scare me offensively. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to wait until I play the Knicks until I make a, a true read on, on the defense. Which is a wild thing to say about a Thibodeau <laughs> team, right? That like, oh, their, <laughs> yeah, their offense yeah. was so good last year. I want to see how we are yeah. we fair against them. So there's this thing I've been doing with guests so far on the pregame pod. And it's it's a very specific question that like only the, the opposing team's person could answer. You know, like I asked like five greatest Celtics or three greatest Hawks, uh, three biggest Hawks rivals. And the Pelicans find themselves when I for this question in an interesting spot because there's the the Hornets aspect of it. So it's kind of a two part question: Do Pelicans fans factor in the Hornets portion of their franchise as like it's a, it's a New Orleans thing as far as greatest players are concerned? And then as a result, if if you could give us who the let's go with the Mount Rushmore, the four greatest Hornets, excuse me, Pelicans are. Um, who would you say and who universally would be like the four names that get thrown out there? I understand like it's a younger franchise. Yeah. Um, I think so longevity with the team has to factor in here. Um, uh, and, and so, but yes, the first question, you know, the new Orleans, uh, the Hornets part of the franchise, it, it's, it's when the team moved to new Orleans in 2002. I mean, that's the, so you, the, the I think the, the bigger question would be like Pete Maravich, like, do we right. go back to the New Orleans? Do we go to the Jazz? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I don't know if that would count, but it's the, let's just take 2002 onward. I mean, I think 
Um, because like the first, the, you think about a guy like Jamal Mashburn, who I love, uh, you know, but, but he only played the New Orleans for like a year. And so like, mm-hmm. you can't really put like, someone like him on there, but Baron Davis is probably the first guy who goes really? on. Really? Okay. Um, I think, uh, uh, Chris Paul has to be. And so that there's just that, that's non-negotiable. Um, I think, I think AD has to be on there, even though. Pelicans, the way he went, the way he went out, I think that's probably. I, I'm still like, I'm still salty about it. I think Pelicans fans are certainly salty about it, but like, I can the, imagine you know, the, years, the years he put in and what he contributed to the franchise. I think he has to be, and then, I, and then Drew Ho- Drew Holiday, I think, has to be on there too. Um, and so, I think so. Obviously, what's missing is anything recent, right? Um, I and, and so I, I just don't. The team hasn't had sustained success enough. For me to put any of the current guys on there. The closest is probably Brandon Ingram because he's played more games simply than Zion. But I'm not, I don't, uh, he's not at the point where I think he ends up supplanting any of those other four names on there yet. Baron Davis is the next one to go, certainly. Cause I, I think, I think CP3 and Drew Holiday are beloved by the city. Um, the, the Phoenix Suns playoff series aside, which got a little testy. Um, and then AD, again, it, there's, there's bitterness there, but he played with the team for a long time. He set a bunch of records. Like, the team, like you said, the team doesn't have a huge kind of runway to, to work with 20 years or so. So um, let's let's see the next couple of years how they play out. If we can supplant BD or for the bitter Pelicans fan, Anthony Davis, with one or two of the names in the current current regime. Yeah, we we did a, a Patreon pod this summer of trying to decide every franchise's goat. And Chris Paul has a case for two different franchises between the Clippers and then the the Hornets Pelicans, uh, the New Orleans Sabre version Clippers, of it, honestly. which <laughs> it, it is. You got to go back to I forget who who it is. There's a, a guy that won an MVP, Bob McAdoo, uh, won an MVP, and then um, like yeah, won a couple scoring titles uh, at the beginning of his career, and that's it. Like that that's the the comp if you want to give someone a chance to to compete with CP3. Um, I, man, if Kawhi or Paul George were to sign an extension and then actually win a thing, then potentially they could enter that conversation. Um, okay. That, that that's where I figured the, the, the Mount Rushmore would go. I, the only follow-up I have is about Anthony Davis. Like if w- would Pelicans fans prefer to see him leave the Mount Rushmore conversation because of how salty they are, like say Zion gets them Pelicans to the second round. It's like, this is, we're putting him in the Mount Rushmore. Would there be a world where AD, like we just remove him because of how he left and how that last season went specifically? Well, I, I think it's pretty binary where if you have AD on there, he's on there for you mm-hmm. because he was that good and you just don't, you're not that upset about how he left or he's, you know, mm. like he's definitely not on there because of how he left. And so um, in, in those cases, you probably have, uh, you know, the Baron Davis is probably the one that's getting axed on off, off of that, that guy group. Um, gotcha. Because, yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, so there's probably two very opinionated groups of people there. I'm I'm sure. I, I don't think Knicks the Knicks have anybody like that. Like I, I get it, the franchise hasn't won a ton in the last couple of decades, but you know, I like Melo. I think can be pol- polarizing. Carmelo Anthony has his like I'm a, I have a Melo jersey behind me. I'm obviously a fan, <laughs> but yeah. there's no like the way he left. There's no way he he turned on the fan base or rubbed Knicks fans the wrong way. It's just like you didn't win enough. Like that's the the conversation around Melo. There's no ill will. Like he was he was at opening night, got a standing ovation from the Garden crowd. Um, you know, I, I it, it comes with the territory of not winning a ton. That when you have a guy that wins a little, he gets mentioned in the in the Mount, Rush, Mount Rushmore conversations. You know. Yeah, and I, I feel like when it comes to New York specifically, as a, as we talked about, I'm, I'm a Yankees fan because my dad's from New say, York, and, yeah. and and with that, it's with Ra- the, the Ra- Mount Rushmore conversation, it's a little bit different because with New York, sometimes you can't the you you the media is too much for you. That that it, it's you know you get kind of overwhelmed by that, and so a lot of times you have guys who maybe you got a big contract and you fulfill that contract, but that's not a guy you're talking about for the Mount Rushmore conversation. So we're talking about the best of the best. Yeah, it, it, I I can imagine that with with when it comes to the Knicks, there's it's there's not a lot of like. Uh, quest jump balls or question marks, and it's like the Knicks really fall under the Mets category because of <laughs> like they haven't won a ton. Yeah. So 
like we're Tom Seaver, won one World Series, won a bunch of Cy Youngs, and yeah. like that that's easy for a goat conversation. And then you yeah. throw like DeGrom and David Wright in there, like Piazza gets in there for one playoff appearance or two playoff appearances in, yeah, in yeah. eight years. So I'm sorry. See, Mason, you did it. So <laughs> our audience has been upset with me that I keep talking baseball on this Knicks podcast. And I made a vow like, okay, I'll stop talking baseball. This is now the second straight pregame pod where baseball came up and I couldn't help myself. I promise. It's my, it's my fault. It's, it's, my it's fault, Mason's so. fault. It's the Yankee fans fault. Okay. We'll blame him. Um, last question before I let you go. Um, I like to get the outsider's perspective on what the Knicks are doing and the how like there are certain Knicks fans that think the, the sky is falling. We've built this thing incorrectly. And then I'll usually talk to somebody like, Oh, well, they're actually pretty impressed at how the Knicks, are, are going so not to lead you in too much into your thoughts but what are your what's your thoughts on what the Knicks are have done over the last couple of years yeah I, I mean the I always question the Randall contract um mm. I, I think it was built off of like one really good year and I just wasn't sold that he was he, like the same questions that maybe you have the people have about Brandon Ingram like is he is he a guy that's going to contribute to truly to winning and enough of a way to give him that kind of that kind of deal? But that's really, I think, where my any harsh criticisms end. I mean, I I, I think that they've done a good job, um, kind of especially finding talent around the edges. Um, the Brunson contract clearly looks fantastic. Um, I, I think uh, you know, uh, quick quickly has been phenomenal for them. I love Josh Hart. I mean, that that <laughs> you know, that's a guy who if you could put like a uh, a role player on a Mount Rushmore, like that's a, the, and he, he didn't play for New Orleans for long enough, but the fan base just loved him. Yeah. Uh, and so like that, it's, it's impossible not to love a guy who works that hard. Um, and so I think the big questions, and we probably had the similar conversation last year when we talked this is how do they get to the next level? Uh, especially in the East where man, <laughs> the team they lost to on opening night is, I, they might be my, I think they might be my pick for the title. And I, again, not to bring it back to baseball, but I'm not a, like Boston is just, Oh, I'm not, it same. Yeah. It pains As a me Jets to, fan, to I get it. it. Believe me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it pains me to say Boston would be the, the, the title pick, but I, I think what they were able to do again, it relies on Porzingis staying healthy, but I mean, the way they were able, able to add holiday after the bucks jettisoned him for game, like that team is really good. And there's no, no shame in losing to, to a team like that. And so again, one, one game assessment, but, but I, I do feel like the, the, the team's got solid, solid depth through you know eight or nine. Uh, and as a New Orleans guy, I'm a big Mitchell Robinson fan. If he can stay healthy, but yeah, I mean, like, what is what is the move? And I'd be question for you. It's kind of like, what is the move to take this team to the next level? And it's not to say you're going to be better than the, than the Bucks and Celtics, but how do you cement yourself as like with the, all the drama going on in Philly? Th- I feel like the third best team in the West is is for the taking. Um, mm-hmm. You know, with no disrespect to Cleveland because I think Cleveland's going to win 50 games this year, and they're kind of my pick for the three seed right now. But that, that's an attainable goal, I think. If you, you're, you, the Knicks might be one move away from getting to third in the West, the third in the East. And so, I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on it. How does that happen? So the pipe dream, which I have no idea how realistic that pipe dream becomes next summer, is Embiid asks out, sure. and he's a CAA client. Which that's just yep. the preface for every single Knicks target <laughs> is CAA client. OG Ananobi, yep. Paul George, you name it. Uh, Donovan Mitchell, um, yep. the Zion. Mitchell. So Zion, I will say the I do think enough Knicks fans have been I don't want to say scared off by the injury concerns, but invested in I just at a certain point there was a there was a long point there was a long time when I don't know how you experienced this, but there's a long time where Knicks fans thought Zion always wanted to go to New York. They had the worst lottery odds or the best lottery odds, but it was the first year of the flattened lottery odds. Um, and the Knicks had the worst record and he wanted to go to New York and then lottery night happens and the Knicks had the three pick. Um, there was a thought that they were going to pair him with RJ because they were friends at Duke and roommates and the Zion wasn't attainable. That's the superstar they're eventually going to trade for. That's that has since gone away because of the availability concerns. I have no idea what a 65 game season from Zion will do to that conversation. Um, but that that's always going to be there. Yeah. I I really think this is this team's built really well. But it someone brought up on a, a shout out to one of our patrons named Busy. Um, he brought up this point on a town hall we did the other night that is has been resonating with me since. 
like because they're two stars, Brunson and Randall, who like they are stars in their own right. Br- Brunson's a borderline all star. Randall's a two time all NBA, two time all star at this point. But they're both so flawed. And then the rest of the team elevates them. Like it's usually supposed to be your best players elevate yeah, the role players true. on the team. Yeah. But they're two stars. Like Jalen Brunson is outstanding in isolation. He is efficient in from two point range from three point range. He gets to the line. He's crafty, but he can be a traffic cone on defense and isn't the greatest passer. So, like with the Randall, like I'm sure you better than anybody know the the Julius Randall experience. Although he wasn't this much of a three point usage yeah. uh, volume guy when he was in New Orleans. Like there is some. Uh, diminishing returns on Julius Randle being one of your two best players. Yep. Yet Emmanuel quickly is like a, a Swiss army knife. That's only getting better. And every advanced metric metric loves him. new Mitchell Robinson has all of these great defensive metrics to him and offensive rebound machine, like Quentin Grimes off ball and on ball defense, Josh Hart, like everything a Tibbs, team needs is Josh Hart to a D and they have all these role players that elevate their two stars. And it's like the Knicks almost built the team backwards in that (laughs) they built out the role players and the team perfectly. Now they just need the star. And if free agency was a thing, maybe you could go get them, but we're in an era where you're going to have to trade probably most of these role players for the star. So again, and beads the, the, the star that I think they'd all love to target. I, I, I'm curious if the Paul George thing becomes a thing. If the Clippers crash and burn again, I think Balmer is going to want to have stars when he opens that building. So who knows? And I do think the Donovan Mitchell conversation is going to happen again. I have no idea how real it's going to be. I, I, my eyes, I thought is that he ends up in like Brooklyn or Miami potentially. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the, that's the state of the Knicks as, as far as I'm concerned that they, they they have a ceiling because of their two best players, but their floor is also really high because of how well this roster is built. Yeah, I, I hear a lot of similarities with, with New Orleans too, um, and not not about kind of how the the role players prop up the stars, but it's kind of like you have re- your best players have really good at certain things, but they're not versatile. I think, mm-hmm. and that's a, that's similar situation with with New Orleans where you've got like a guy who can rebound but really not defend, or a guy who defends but not rebound and can't shoot, and so like. There's a lot of there's a lot of that, a lot of that going on. I think the Donovan Mitchell thing is really interesting because mm. I I don't think he's long for Cleveland. Obviously, he didn't want to go there in the first place, but he's he is the kind of I mean, I, and I think with the emergence of Darius Garland like continuing, like he's a that feels like a guy that they could potentially move at some point uh, for the same reasons. But like that's just uh, is it like shuffling deck chairs to a degree? Like you you wouldn't put him with Brunson, right? Like I feel like he's probably better than Brunson, but like not like massively better than Brunson, right? So it, interesting name. So it depends what they have to trade for Brunson. Because here's the the scenario that, that shout out to our capologist, but one of our co-hosts, Jeremy, who brought this up, that if you can leverage the fact that Mitchell wants to leave anyway, like you, you may have to go all in, who knows? But if you don't have to give up too much for Mitchell, and then you can pivot and go get Carl Anthony Towns, another distressed asset. And you put Randall in that conversation, you know, like it's Rand- like, who knows? Like that's the pivot is like, can you get both Brunson, like Brunson and, and Brunson and Mitchell could work if you're just like saying, we're going to go all in on offense and just create like a juggernaut on offense. Um, I think Tibbs would, lose his mind. But that's why last season was so revealing in that like the Knicks had the 18th best defense. You know, like a Tom Thibodeau team was bottom 12 in defense, but they were top three in offense. So you almost wonder if that's the flexibility that they are are able to be okay with not being like a bottom five offense anymore, but like then a top 10 defense. And if they're able to, you know, find a middle ground for both, but then be or or just be a lead at offense. Who knows? Um the, the Mitchell well, thing the, I also is something I, I'm paying attention to, too, though. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the best the best defense is scoring every time you go down Four the more floor. Points. Yeah. Defense yeah. In half court. And so, like, Schmidt, Schmidt wrote an article about this, too, too recently. For, is that, yeah, I mean, you can have a, 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 a bad half court defense is still better than a good transition defense. Right. Yeah. And so. Yeah, that that is something. There's something to be said for that, and so the, the the point was really around how Zion helps makes the Pelicans' defense better. It's not the you know not intuitive because 
I don't think he's a bad defender. I think it's that that concerns overblown, but he's not a good defender. He's a good help defender, but not really a good team defender. But if you're scoring every time you get down the floor and you're, <laughs> you're playing defense, your your defense is set. Suddenly, you're a lot better defensive team, uh, and so I think that's. I mean, offense being your best defense is a reasonable strategy. So, the last question before I let you let you go: the Knicks head to uh, New Orleans on Saturday night, and it's it's the that's geez, it's back to back games uh, for the home opener. They will be playing back to back home openers for the team that will be home. Um, is there? It, is the is the Pelicans fan base misunderstood because to the NBA Twitter the outside world it can be said or it has been said I think that like there's no home court advantage it's not a basketball city is some of that unfair if you want to give more of a perspective on it from a Pelicans fan there's there's it's overblown but there's there's kernels of, of truth in there and so I think the team the the, the, the fan base wants the Pelicans to prove it. Mm-hmm. Um, because when, when they were, you know, making a run in the playoffs a couple of years ago and, and they played the, the Phoenix Suns and lost in six games, the, the crowd was awesome. I mean, this, this, the city supports winners. Um, and so there is the question of early in the season, if the saints are really good, there might be a little bit of a lag as far as really filling up the arena, um, versus if the saints are trash and I really know what to make of the saints this year, they are kind of trash but they're also like okay i don't know mm-hmm. that but, division's so wide open so <laughs> you know yeah so um but i think this team like you know they see zion and bi healthy and playing and, and the, the main guys healthy they're gonna show up and so i think this the family's been burned by injuries so many times and look it's a, it's a smaller market team so this kind of stuff will happen um but i think the team that they see the best players playing it's an exciting offensive fire firepower team when all the guys are healthy and so I, I do think that the, the fans will show up and and be loud and, and be awesome. But if the injuries come and and the team starts losing again, you're like yeah, they're gonna the fan base is gonna get frustrated. I mean, my my father's season ticket holder and mm. voices the same concerns to me. You know, every about this team that they can't if they can't stay healthy. Why am I spending all my hard earned money on them um, if if we're not going to see the best product on the floor every night? And so I, I get it. Um, but but I would again to conclude like they the team supports winning basketball uh, or the city supports winning basketball. Um, I have no concerns over the arena, not being packed as long as they're, you know, as long as they're showing the fan base that they, you know, people should show up. You know? <laughs> well, um, I wish the Pelicans luck because they are an interesting team to watch. They're a good league pass yeah. team to, to yeah. check in on. Um, so I wish you the best in every game, except Saturday night. Um, Mason, thank you so much for joining me for this pregame show. Uh, before you get out of here, tell the fine folks at home where they can find all your stuff. Yeah. Um, so I'm uh, relegated to most of this podcast in these days, but uh, Shimit and I uh, do the in the know podcast. Uh, so Mostly uh, Pelicans talk, um, and, and so I, I will say he does a he does a great job. He has a a sub stack that's really focused on Pelicans and NBA at large. It's free to subscribe. So um, if you're interested in the Pelicans, even tangentially, and you you know you're, you're it's it's really good insight. And so again, free free to sign up for that. But yeah, I'm I'm mostly just doing the podcast with him at this point. Thank you, Mason, for joining me. Yeah, you got it. Thanks for having me.